Hi, this is part one of a three-part uh, video series on the Second Persian War, uh, and we're specifically looking part one at the Battle of Thermopylae. Now, if we're trying to understand uh, the battle itself, whoops, um, you have to sort of get this big picture view of why uh, a few of these battles take place. So, for example, Thermopylae, um, which is part one of this video series, uh, Salamis will be part two, and the Battle of Plataea will be part three. So with the Battle of Thermopylae, this is almost like a holding or a diversionary force uh, that is sent initially to um, hold against the Persians who are marching from the Persian mainland, or the, um, from the north of the Greek mainland, and they're pushing down south uh, towards Thermopylae. There is a second battle um, that's happening simultaneously. So day one of Battle of Thermopylae is also day one of the Battle of Artemisium. And this is a naval fight between um, Athenian triremes, their boats, and uh, the Persian boats. Okay, And there's almost this holding pincer where the, the main aim of the Persians was to push south along the mainland and also um, have their navy following side by side uh, because they learned from the mistakes of Marathon. And what their aim was uh, for the Persian navy was to land their marines, their naval soldiers, here and in order, uh, in order to circle around um, and pin to the, the force that was here. That way it's it's almost like no matter what is happening, um, they can circle in behind any force, uh, no matter what sort of um, battlefield they're looking at. So the Battle of Artemisium led by the, the Greeks, so Artemisium here, led by the Athenians in particular, hold successfully hold the Persians here for three days. Okay, And they're the same three days that the Battle of Thermopylae is occurring. So if the, in that case, um, we actually have the Persians only having a frontal assault rather than being able to sort of attack from behind. So the Battle of Thermopylae itself is a three-day um, fight happening in August, uh, August of uh, 480 BCE. And the terrain is picked by Spartiot soldiers in particular because the Spartans are leading this campaign. And they've designed it so it's 50 men wide. So no matter the size of the Persian ar army, they cannot exceed 50 men side by side. Okay, And given that the Spartiate soldiers numbering 300, and in total about a thousand Spartan soldiers in general, where 300 are Spartiate, 700 are um, probably perioikoi, uh, that combined force can almost hold this narrow path um, for an extended period of time. And the Spartan soldiers are also backed up by a, a number of Greek nations, and we'll have a look um, at the actual statistics in a, in a little bit. But Xerxes, uh, who is leader of Persia at the time, is watching this from one of the cliff faces, and he's actually watching the Spartan soldiers to you know, see their tactics, but also to eventually um, watch their defeat. Um, and so for the first two days, the number of Greeks numbered about 7,000. 7, okay, and we know that there's roughly, you know, according to modern estimates, anywhere between 700 and 800,000 um, Persian soldiers, but so, uh, many of which um, make up the Marines, so they're off uh, on naval forces. So we probably have roughly uh, anywhere between 200 to 300,000 um, soldiers who are on foot pushing down uh, towards this, um, this narrow path at Thermopylae. And so in terms of the statistics, we are looking at um, two ancient historians, Diodorus Siculus and Herodotus, and we're looking at roughly, according to Herodotus, anywhere between five just under five and a half thousand and six thousand soldiers. Uh, and that's um, soldiers that are primarily made up of other city states um, with around a thousand um, 
Spartans, 300 of which are Spartiate. Whereas Diodorus is looking at about 7,500 uh, men um, as the defensive force. But again, significantly different to those of what the, per the Persians are putting up against. Uh, and the Persians are probably anywhere up to 300,000, um, despite what Herodotus is claiming to be two, two and a half million. And so with the immortal soldiers uh, on the Persian force, these are the best trained um, Persian soldiers that, the, that they have to offer. Okay, and the, the benefit with the uh, the immortals is that once they die they're actually replaced um, and they're relatively quickly replaced so with the spartan uh, yeah so when we're looking at the battle itself king leonidas uh, is commanding the um, spartan soldiers whereas xerxes uh, is leading the persians and as I said before, we're probably looking at about, I mean, despite Herodotus is two and a half million, it's probably more likely to be 300,000 or 250 to 300,000. Uh, and in terms of uh, casualties, we're looking at significant losses um, for the uh, Persian army compared to uh, the Greeks. And so psychologically that will have an impact. So even though it is a military defeat for the Greeks, this is one of the most significant psychological ba battles that Persia faces. Because think about it in this way. If you have 300 Spartiate soldiers who are prepared to fight and die rather than run in battle, even though they know they cannot win this battle, psychologically that will have a lasting impact in that you know, what happens when you come against 10,000 Spartiate soldiers or 40,000 Spartiate soldiers? That has this lasting, lingering impact that you'll see in these future battles is an ongoing effect. Now, is this the reason they're able to win some of the later wars? That's up to you. Um, but this psychological impact will inevitably have a lasting sort of fear in the hearts of these soldiers, especially when they watch the immortal soldiers die at the hands of the Spartans. And they think, you know, this is literally our best soldiers falling easily against the Spartan soldiers. So in terms of um, the battlefield itself, the Spartan soldiers um, lead this, but it's also the Greek nations in general that are holding this point. Some Greeks, um, particularly the Phoetian um, army, is sent up to this mountain goat path in order to hold the point. But the tactics used against it, and you can sort of see it in the videos here, the tactics used against this frontline rank do not work at all. Uh, because the the Spartan soldiers and the Greeks in general have significantly better equipment and armor. Okay, they're still using this um, huge hoplon shield um, made of bronze against the wicker shields of the the Greeks uh, of the P uh, Persians, sorry. And so, in terms of tactics and the strength of these armies, um, Greece will always sort of have significantly better trained better equipped men in these fights. So this point from here to here, we're roughly looking at 50 um, soldiers, as I said before. But this entire terrain renders the cavalry useless and archers are actually bouncing off the shields. Um, so in terms of, you know, tactically who has the advantage, hands down, it's the Greek soldiers. Okay, and the Persian soldiers send wave after wave okay, against the um, Greeks and they fall every time. The next wave is to send in the immortals. Okay, and this is all happening on the first day. So send in your best possible force and they fall against the Spartan shields as well. Okay, it's very difficult to beat these Spartan um, soldiers. 
and using um, this as an example, uh, we're going to use the film 300. I mean, it's not amazing as a, as a resource, but it is good to see the shield wall in action because as the Spartans sort of take the brunt of the force, it doesn't matter the number of soldiers against them because eventually there's going to be a holding point and a chokehold where the Persians cannot push any further. Okay, and they become so crushed that they have no sort of momentum anymore. And the, the Spartan soldiers just need to hold the point. They just need to hold the point and uh, eventually push back and um, slaughter the, the Persians. And you can see it in this film here where they hold and then they're able to push, push the shield back, stab, reform the shield wall and repeat. Okay, and this happens um, for the three days. This is the Greek fighting phalanx. Okay, so shield wall, push out, stab, reform the shield wall. Now, things like this are unlike, uh, unlikely where you have individuals breaking the shield wall in order to push out. Um, but apart from that, it's a very sort of good way of understanding it. Now, looking at the uh, source evidence that we have on uh, the battle itself, we know the Persians um, fired a series of arrows, a barrage of arrows, uh, on the Greek lines. Um, and we know the tactics of the Persians still apply. So the use of a cavalry and the use of um, archers is sort of like the primary, or is one of the major uh, sort of front lines. And we have the Persians launch launching the first front um, assault. Uh, so on day one, where the Persians push from this point into uh, the Spartan um, front line. And we know according to Diodorus and the Phalanx style, as per Herodotus in the um, Battle of Marathon, that the men stood shoulder to shoulder. And the Greeks, all Greeks, not just the Spartans, uh, were superior in valor, so honor, and in great size of their shields. We know again from the Battle of Marathon that the, the, the Spartans, and by extent every Greek nation, has significantly better uh, weaponry and armor. So we know the uh, hoplon shield, the bronze hoplon shield uh, of the Greeks, as opposed to the weaker shields of the, um, the Persians. And so we've got weaker, I mean, they're weaker um, shields. Uh, according to Greek physicians writing in this period, we, we know, I mean, physicians are doctors. So we've got um, doctors who are writing about eyewitness, uh, from eyewitness statements using medical sort of jargon. But for the purpose of this, he describes, a doctor describes um, the Persian front line as being cut to ribbon. So they're being repeatedly cut so thin that it is like strips of ribbon afterwards. So you can see significantly more um, powerful um, Greeks to the, the Persians. Quite possibly that's, um, or it is an example of um, why the Spartans and by extent every Greek is able to win um, sort of one-on-one -on -one skirmishes. So Herodotus and Diodorus, um, both ancient historians, describe Xerxes then launching the 10,000 immortals. Uh, they summarize that it, you know, as they, they failed to make headway, um, but ultimately they, they're defeated. Um, and psychologically, this impact will be everlasting. So every time the immortals come face to face with the Spartiates, it becomes that psychological sort of, they have to overcome their fear of the Spartans before they even go into battle with the Spartans. Okay, and that reputation of Spartiates just absolutely dominating the uh, immortals then has a ripple effect into um, the other battles because if you, the best of your army is unable to even, you know, kill a single Spartiate, then what is, you know, and then that's 300 of them. Imagine what 10,000 or 50,000 are like. 
Okay, it becomes this psychological battle where you're beaten before you even go into battle. Uh, Spartans also used um, a tactic very successfully against the immortals, which was this um, idea of feigning retreat. So they would break ranks, turn and look like they're running. But as we know from Agogi training and as we know from Spartan training in general, they would never break the line. Okay, it is tactical and it is outmaneuvering your enemy. Okay, so they broke ranks, lured the immortals to break their ranks. They re uh, they turned, reformed the shield line, and killed the the immortals. And that happens quite often. Okay, it's a very effective tactic during this battle, during all of these battles, really. Then we have day two of the battle. Okay, so day one complete um, loss for uh, the Persians. Um, you know, a few, a handful of Greeks are killed during this first wave, which is demoralizing. The second day, uh, Xerxes sent infantry to attack the pass, so infantry being um, foot soldiers to attack the pass. And his mentality, I mean, this is Herodotus describing his mentality, but, I mean, logically you would think after a day of fighting, these Greek soldiers are broken, right? They're going to be wounded, they're going to be crippled from this, and they're going to be exhausted, right? And so he says, supposing that their enemies, the Greeks, being so few, I mean, we outnumber them, you know, at best estimate, seven and a half thousand Greeks to 300, well, 250 to 300,000 Persians were now disabled by wounds and could no longer resist. The Greeks could not uh, hold off any longer. Uh, so later the second day, um, Xerxes, leader of the Persians, uh, receives information from uh, a traitor to the Greeks. He is Greek, but he's a traitor to the cause, um, Ephialates, uh, about this secret mountain pass. So the Spartiates leading the, the cause send up the Phoetians to hold this mountain pass, while the um, Persians sitting you know, in the Persian camp actually find this secret mountain pass and send a, an army of 200,000, uh, sorry, 20,000 soldiers up this pass. Okay, and so they're significantly outnumbered and the Phoetians, knowing that they're going to uh, lose this battle, actually send a runner uh, back to the Greek camp to pass the message that this mountain pass will fall and ultimately the Spartan front will fall as well. So on day three, okay, knowing that the Phoetian guarding that pass can't hold it, having had the message passed back to the Greek phalanx, so the Spartiates um, who are positioned here, know that they can't hold this any further. Okay, and Leonidas holds a council uh, at dawn, so dawn on the third day, and identifies that the, the, the fight's over. Okay, the, the Spartans will fall, the Greeks will fall, um, but ultimately they held for three days. And the Spartiate soldiers end up telling everyone to return home. Um, and so they and the Thebans, so here, Sparta and Thebes continue to hold this passage. Okay, and the reason Thebes stays is because the Spartans don't actually trust them. And rightfully so, because you'll see that Thebes actually swap sides um, during this battle. So the Spartans hold with the Thebans and then send every other um, army home. So the Athenians, the Phoetians, and many other societies end up returning home to pass on the message to prepare for battle. Um, and to spend time with their families before the war begins. So Herodotus um, describes Xerxes' immortals as encircling them. So um, Xerxes sends his immortals up the pass and around behind. So behind them eventually will be immortals and in front of them the remaining potentially 200,000 soldiers. Uh, However, in this final confrontation, the Spartans actually psychologically um, cripple the Persians and by extent Xerxes, 
because the Spartans kill both of uh, Xerxes' brothers. Um, eventually, Leonidas is uh, killed by a Persian archer. So the Thebans surrender, and this is what I was sort of prefacing before. During this battle, with only the Spartans and the Thebans remaining, uh, the Thebans actually surrender. They move to, away from their companions, the Spartans, and with their hands upraised, sign of sort of retreat and, um, and you know, surrender, really, uh, to, uh, uh, advance towards the barbarians, these being the Persians. Of the remaining Spartan defenders, so of the remaining 290, whatever, um, because Leonidas is dead and they've sent one Spartan runner home to pass on the message of these glorious 300, uh, and a couple have died um, from wounds and battles throughout the, the um, last day. Of the remaining Spartan defenders, here they defended themselves to the last. Every single one of those who remained died. Those who still had swords using them, and the others resisting with their hands and teeth. They literally fought until they had no weapons, and then when they had no weapons, they continued to fight, and they clawed at them, and they bit at the enemy until they all fell. So according to Herodotus, we're looking at about 20,000 Persian casualties. Psychologically, that's quite damaging, because you're looking at roughly tw uh, two to 4,000 Greek casualties, but ultimately, on the final day, 300 Spartans, or just under 300 Spartans, stood fought and died without turning and running. And it's that that mentality of the Spartans are so prepared to die that not a single one of them um, ran. They didn't even show fear. And that echoes, that reputation echoes not just for the Greeks, which is why all of the Greeks are so prepared to follow them into battle and to you know, fight and die with the Spartans, but it has that echo effect into the Persians. Like potentially this fight and this psychological victory for the Greeks, even though it's a military defeat, it's psychological victory echoes for the entirety of this battle, uh, this battle, this war, and for every battle that comes sort of after Thermopylae. So Herodotus has a very fitting sort of memorial to them. So when the barbarians discharged their, sh uh, their arrows, they obscured the light of the sun by the multitude of arrows. There were so many arrows fired at the Spartans that it blackened the sky. So great was the number of their hosts. So so many um, Persians. He, being Leonidas, was not dismayed by this. He said that their guests brought them very good news. And this is, think about the Spartan mentality and um, love of war. For if they, being the Persians, obscured the, uh, the light of the sun with all of the arrows that are being discharged, the battle against them would be in the shade and not in the sun. It's that just sheer psychological um, indoctrination where the Spartans are so prepared to fight and die that they're cracking jokes. At, their, uh, at the Persian expense. So as we remember from, um, hopefully, from a Gogi training and also the importance of sort of the military, hopefully you remember that um, only Spartans who die in battle and women who die in childbirth are granted um, tombstones. So you can see the importance of this um, battle because we're looking at, I mean, this is a modern day recreation, but we're looking at the statue of the grave site of Leonidas. Um, there's another statue on the actual site of Thermopylae today. And it's this echo that has the reputation of how amazing Sparta was in this battle. And so you have to think psychologically, what impact would this battle and this sort of almost embarrassment for the Persians to be held for so long against so few, what, what effect would that have on future battles? Would the Persians still have the sort of momentum to fight? Would they be you know, petrified by facing the Spartans again? Is this 
the thing that sort of cripples the Persians against the Spartans uh, or the Greeks in general, or is this merely just a three-day campaign that you know wiped out Leonidas and his three hundred and you know all of those Greeks who stood beside him? You can be the decision. <laughs>